Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. You're welcome to this part of the Sharia Intelligence course where we will be starting on the subject of the Qawaid al fiqhiyah or the Islamic legal maxims or Islamic legal philosophy as it has been described by certain scholars. With me to discuss this topic are two of our distinguished guests and trainers, facilitators in this field of Sharia intelligence. Uh, Sister Salatu Suleh and Brother Nasir Bello, you are both most welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Alhamdulillah. I am your host, Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu, and today we will be looking at what exactly are these legal maxims, why are they important? And I'd like to start with asking Brother Nasir, what exactly do we mean by Islamic legal maxims? Why are these important? A'udhu billahi sami'il alim min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim um, Islamic legal maxims will be better appreciated and understood uh, using this particular story. Um, it is a story about a king who gathered all the men of wisdom uh, in his kingdom and then asked them to uh, put together all the wisdoms uh, of this world that they might know of. So they decided to put them all together in one book and they brought the book to him. And he looked at the book and he said, uh, much as I want to go through this book, obviously I don't have the time. Can you summarize it in just five sentences uh, such that these five sentences have embodied and captured almost everything that uh, I need to know regarding this wisdom that you put together. Um, so they did that in five sentences. So the idea of Islamic legal maxims is just like these five sentences which embody uh, the wisdom. Uh, it's, it's like the rule of thumb, the aporisms, the compact uh, wisdom, condensed knowledge that is put together. Uh, it is like an abstraction, uh, uh, a shorthand abstraction that sort of a guideline in few sentence, in one sentence, uh, in every field, um, typical of uh, rules that are known in different fields. Like uh, when you are crossing the road, they will say you look left, then look right, then look left again, then you cross. Uh, or they will say if you you shouldn't put water uh, on acid, but put acid on water, or you shouldn't put. Uh, 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 or, or, or maybe they say the rule of nothing about us, I guess about us without us. Uh, and they will say you cannot test the depth of water with two feet. You have to maybe put in the first one and see the depth before otherwise there will be problem. Uh, people are innocent until proven guilty. These are some of the examples that you can find uh, of aporisms or this uh, short wisdom that encompasses a lot of things that have a lot of lessons that you can learn. So these are typical of uh, what in Islamic Islamic studies, Islamic science, uh, the idea of Islamic legal maxims are. Um, uh, they are the early scholars articulation of the spirit of Sharia. Um, another interesting example or story is that story where somebody said to a Jewish rabbi that can you read the entire Torah, uh, the entire book of the Jews while standing on your one standing on one leg if you do that then i will accept uh, your religion so the jewish rabbi decided to stand on his one leg and said uh, and then he said um love for your brother what do you love for yourself he said that is the the main message uh, every other thing is an elaboration in the so this kind of one line that embodied everything is what you you you, you find or what 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 the Qawaid or Islamic legal maxims are about. And in the Islamic tradition, we have the five essential uh, maxims of Islamic law. Uh, and, 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 and they are the number one, Al Umuru bi Maqasidiha, that actions are judged according to their own purposes or intentions. Um, we have Al Yaqinu la Yazulu bi Shak, that doubt, uh, uh, certainty is not overruled by doubt. Then we have uh, Harm must be eliminated. Then the, the fourth one 
is al mashaqqa to tajlubu tayseer that hardship begets facility and the last one is al ada to muhakama that custom or culture is authoritative or it has the weight of the law so these are some of the uh, these are the five legal maxims that were agreed by the entire scholars uh, this articulated or represent the entire spirit of islamic law or sharia this, this is interesting um, that scholars are able to summarize the spirit of sharia in five sentences uh, and as i think we will see later uh, that these principles are described as universal these maxims are regarded as universal because they are not domain dependent they don't just serve law they serve morality they serve in every aspect of life um sister salah what could you add to this discussion i would like to start by saying when one thinks of a situation like um, traffic rules and their function when you consider the fact that everybody that gets in a car gets on the road as a destination, they usually have a reason why they're going wherever they're going. And they have the context within which they're working. They have their various um, skills and abilities behind that wheel. They have um, thoughts on going on in their minds. You have all these variants and variations. The traffic rules are there to ensure safety regardless of how many years this person has been driving, regardless of the destination of that person. It's to bring together or to help people hold in their minds things that help ensure the greatest safety for the greatest number of people most of the time. When we look at the role of the maxims, they play the role of traffic rules, traffic regulations where you say, um, I think we had mentioned this once before, that usul al fiqh, that is the foundation of the study of Islamic jurisprudence, is like learning how to drive a car. So if usul al fiqh is like learning how to drive a car, then al kawaid al is the traffic, is the body of um, traffic rules that guide how you drive a car. And then the makosud, which we've mentioned before, and we'll come back to again, that's like the destination where you wish to go. It's for this purpose that we would say it's essential, therefore, that in coming up with rulings, mujtahid, um, they are usually concerned about sticking to al kawaid aligning their rulings with al kawaid al fiqhiyya, especially where they are dealing with, um, let's say, uh, rulings in situations where there would be heavy consequences at the end of whatever ruling they make, where the situation is sensitive or where the community or the individual are in a state of haja that is in a state of difficulty or a state of darura where they are in a state of dire necessity in as much as as a general rule there is the jurists respect the maxims they are more concerned about these maxims and these maxims become more vital when you have these what we would call um, heavy duty vehicles because you have your road rules generally, but everybody is, um, everyone knows that if you are driving behind a heavy duty vehicle, you have to be extra cautious. You have to give more distance. You can't just overtake the way we usually do. There are a few more rules to guide. Or if you are the one driving a heavy duty vehicle, there are things you have to be more careful of. In fact, not um, everyone can just get a license to drive a heavy duty vehicle first time off. So we have these considerations, and that is one of the thing, things that the Kawaiid actually help with to help people navigate as they pursue those vital ends that Islam protects. And um, one more thing to add is that al Kawaiid of Fikhiya, in as much as it may sound like um, a separate field from Usul of Fikh, it is a separate field, but it is interlaced interwoven with the tools of Uso because you have those tools that once, once you understand what the Kawaiid are and you look at the tools of Uso, especially the tools like the safety net and principles, you will realize that at the end of the day, it's sometimes a matter of terminology. What are you calling what? How are you describing it? And at what point do you um, invoke this tool or do you say, okay, I'm going by way of the um, 
Um, you have already started touching on the importance of this. I'd like you to say more about uh, the importance of this whole field. Uh, uh, while we have touched on usul al-fiqh and we will inshallah be touching on maqasid sharia, the importance of kawaid al-fiqh here, um, or Islamic legal maxims or Islamic legal philosophy, uh, but also I would like us to start looking at the authority. So let's start with the importance. What more would you say okay. on this? As Brother um, Nasser mentioned, the Kawaid are a summarization of Islamic principles. Summarized from what would be the question? What is the main body? The main body is the entire body of Islamic um, legal texts, the, primarily the Quran and the Hadith. Every maxim takes its root not from just one verse or just one hadith, but from co a collection of verses uh, and a collection of hadith. The maxim is in the end a summarization of what multiple hadith have together, have in common by way of what is their implication when taken together, even if their wordings are different. Earlier on in the previous episode, we talked about how we have hadith that are mutawatir or texts that could be mutawatir by way of the words themselves. Then you have those that are mutawatir, meaning they are um, of multiple chain or they have multiple um, evidence or multiple basis because they are similar or identical with regard to their meaning and their implication. This is the basis for al qawaid al here, the Islamic legal maxims. They are rooted, they are anchored, they are derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. For this reason, they perform the function of giving one a bird's eye view of what the Islamic spirit is about. So if a jurist aligns his or her ruling with al qawaid what the jurist is essentially aiming to do is to stay true to the spirit, the general spirit, of Islamic legal principles. Because, you know, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Kawaii, the principles, they are all from the Quran and the Sunnah. Everyone is traceable to a collection of verses and hadith. If a jurist is presented with a situation and has to make a ruling, or if it's a Muslim trying to make a decision about something, it would be easier to remember a particular principle out of a few than to try and remember which verse said exactly what and what was the wording and what was the meaning and which hadith. So instead of combing through a plethora of verses and hadith at first, easier to actually go by way first of the maxim. And because the maxim is already short, it's clearer, easier to remember, then the jurist can then walk backwards from there. And so, okay, if this maxim is here, there must be verses that support this. So one thing it does is helps um, jurists narrow their focus and give them a narrow point to begin from when they want to make a ruling. Another way it functions is to help with triangulation. It's because it's one of the three fields that guide the jurist in ijtihad. And the other two, as I mentioned earlier, are al-maqasid al-sharia and usul al-fiqh. So it helps with that triangulation by offering the jurist many paradigms or perspectives from which to look at a particular issue. So if one thinks of three concentric circles, one circle being al maqasid al-Sharia, another usul al-Fiqh, and the third al qawaid al-Fiqh here, wherever these three circles meet, any ruling that can fall into that space, then the jurist can have this peace of mind that he or she has um, represented the Prophet وسلم, to the best of his or her ability. Sorry, many Kawaid. There are many of them. There are over a thousand of them, and they apply to, there are many that apply to very specific fields. Then you have about 40 to about 100, depending when you're looking at the different works of scholars, the ones they cite that are of a more um, general application. Then you have the five, which Brother Nasser mentions, that are the core, the universal, that apply across um, domains and they apply across time. Which is another thing that I think is beautiful about the Kawaid is their um, essential timelessness. Because they are couched in such general or universal terms that they apply 
again and again through time. They um, help us, or I should say they help the jurist um, with quality control. When a ruling is made, the jurist who is making the ruling, or even before making the ruling, can refer to the Kawaiid to filter whether this ruling is appropriate, because that's one of the things the Kawaiid does. Another thing the Kawaiid do, sorry, another thing that the Kawaiid do is to help us understand whether a ruling fits a particular time. So is it appropriate for this time? So it functions like a barcode, where a barcode does gives you the core information of the item to which it's attached and can give you information such as expiry dates. One last thing um, to mention is that when it comes to trying to understand certain, we'll call them thorny issues, al Kawaiid pre um, present us with sh quick ways of cutting through the jargon, um, semantics, um, splitting of hairs, and nuances to arrive at a decision. Um, a quick example, just before I round up on this particular issue, is when it comes to how does a jurist, how does, a, does anybody assess this question of what is called marital rape? Some people hear marital rape, they say that's an oxymoron. Sexual intimacy is part of being married. That is even what legalizes or legitimizes um, sexual intimacy. How then can you speak of rape? If one simply starts talking in terms of al -Kawaid, the universals, and one says, adora yuzal, harm must be eliminated. So whether you call it marital rape, marital violence, marital sexual violence, marital sexual abuse, you can actually just bypass the semantics of the issue and go to the essence. Is this behavior harmful? If it's harmful, adora yuzal, harm must be eliminated. So the next question would be for um, a jurist, a society, policy makers, um, mediators to say, so what do we do to eliminate the harm? Or if we take the other maximal, masha kotaji libertese, or someone in a state of difficulty must have concessions. If you say, no, it's compulsory that there should be sexual intimacy within marriage, let's assume that's a position. If we take the position that sexual intimacy is part of marriage, cannot be separated from it, therefore it's compulsory, it must take place, let's say yes we, we concede to that we can then say however there's someone in this situation who is suffering harm because of this position so what concessions can be given because al masha kotajil taisir is saying if um that hardship calls for concessions calls for ease um, someone in a situation of hardship or difficulty requires things to be made easy for them so this is just one of those examples that explains how this helps us get quickly to the essence of things and bypass um, jargon, what we might call the acceptable thing and all of that. So in other words, the maxims play a role as a filter yes. to ensure that products of usul or fatwas or products of ijtihad yes. are tested for whether they are in compliance with the spirit of sharia. Absolutely. or not. Uh, and I think we'll come to each of these maxims more carefully to discuss them. Brother Nasir, what would you say on the authority? Uh, Sister Salatu started touching on some of these. What more could you tell us about the authority of these maxims? How, you know, how, Muslim scholars usually don't agree on uh, many things. Uh, they disagree on most things. Uh, yes, they agree on the fundamentals. But um, how has it become easy for them to agree on these uh, five maxims, whether they are Maliki, Shafi, Hanafi, Hanbali, the various schools? Uh, how have these maxims come to be universal? What's, what's the authority? Um, actually, the maxims, if you look at them, are general rulings uh, that have a very few exceptions. And most of these maxims, uh, you would find them either taken directly or paraphrasing or summarizing some guidelines of life taken from Quran and Sunnah. And therefore, if you look at, for example, the first maxim that was uh, uh, mentioned, al-umuru bimaqasidiha, you would find a direct hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which says, uh, actions are judged based on their intentions. 
um, if you look at uh, certainty cannot over is, is not overruled by doubt there is also a hadith leave that which you are doubt, in doubt of uh, to that which you are not in doubt of that is, which is certain um, and also if you look at um, uh, another maxim for example la uh, darara wa la dirara is a hadith of Rasulullah which says uh, you shouldn't harm and also you shouldn't reciprocate harm uh, and that is very much in line with this very known maxim, this very popular maxim of Abdurrahu Yuzal. Um, other hadith that actually become part of the legal maxims are these hadith of that uh, you should love for your brother or you should love for the other what you love for yourself. Um, another hadith uh, that is yasiru wa la tu'asiru, for example, about relief, about ease. Uh, you make things easy, you don't make them difficult. So these are largely uh, direct reflection of a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Though if you look at the maxims, they appear solitary in terms of their wordings. But again, each of these five maxims, you would find verses of the Quran, you would find authentic hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conveying the same meaning. And that was why uh, most scholars agreed that although they are solitary in their wordings but then uh, in terms of meaning they can be categorized as mutawatir ma'anawi just like you have uh, in the in the case of hadith in fact imam shatibi will argue that it is the closest to hadith mutawatir that you can even find and each and every one of these maxims you will find verses of the quran supporting from the verses from from the first one to the last one you will find hadith of the prophet just like we mentioned some you would find athar from companions of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam that are actually trying to bug them of or convey their meaning and you will also find fatwas of great scholars in the muslim tradition uh, that are actually along those uh, trying to expand or trying to support these particular maxims in fact it goes to a level where scholars will say that the moment you see a fatwa contradicting one of these established maxims, then you should be careful. You should, that is signaling the need for you to look at it again, to review it again, because um, these maxims are to a large extent at the level of, you know, near certain, um, just like a shot you will see. Uh, so therefore, probably there is something with the fatwa and you need to look again. In fact, uh, these maxims are another operational uh, framework, uh, very much like repackaging some of the particularly the usul istidlal tools, the tools of maslaha, istihsan, uh, saddu dhariya, fatwa dhariya, that is that are trying to protect the spirit of the law. So it's another route uh, of achieving some of the objectives of sharia that you can find, just like, uh, and that is why it plays a significant role, uh, particularly when triangulated with uh, the maqasid and the usul uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, uh, that we discussed earlier. So in, in, a, in a way, it's just like another safety net uh, in trying to protect the spirit of Sharia. I like this idea that um, just as safety nets, as we discussed earlier in Usul, uh, protect gymnasts and people you know, uh, involved in all sorts of um, acrobatics in the air from any harm, the subject and these legal maxims you know operate as a very large very strong safety net so that whatever intellectual gymnastics uh, no disrespect intended in the process of ijtihad and juristic reasoning these safety nets in the form of qawaid are there to protect the spirit and you know um, raise red flags uh, as soon as it seems there's a problem of uh, disconnect between the letter and the spirit uh, and as you've mentioned earlier sometimes they signal a ruling whose time has expired it shows that look it's no more realizing its objectives in the context um, or the context has changed and you need a new ruling um, I would like you to you touched on these uh, could you go a little more slowly on these five major maxims and what are the key values that each one of them is protecting? I know we will come to them one by one and give a full episode to each one, but could we have by way of summary, 
What exactly are each of these maxims about, briefly? Um, if you look at uh, the five maxims, for example, if you start with al umuru bi maqasidiha, basically that is uh, actions uh, judge according to their own purposes. Uh, what it's trying to, uh, the value that it's trying to promote and protect is actually the issue of purpose, uh, the issue of you know benefit, consequences, the intents behind actions. Um, and this is trying to look at the maqasid in a way and the maslaha, uh, particularly if you look at it within the angle of uh, some of the usul related tools. Now, if you come to the second maxim, uh, which is al yaqeen la yazul bi shak um, certainty is not overruled by doubt. There is about protecting truth. It's about quest for truth. It's about, it's about this bias for evidence, trying to verify, um, trying to, uh, it's, it's related with the idea of istis hub, trying to stay on the status quo, something that is certain, something that has been established. Now, if you look at the third one, uh, which is Abdarar Yuzal, um, it's about uh, trying to eliminate harm. It's about prevention of harm. It's about uh, protection. It's about uh, ensuring that the maqasid, anything that will become an obstacle to the maqasid of Sharia is actually removed out of the way. So essentially it's about what scholars will call jalbi, uh, darul mafasid, anything that is harmful. Um, and therefore there you would find some of the very relevant uh, usul tools of istidlal that plays a significant role there. Uh, again, you would find the maslaha, you will find the saddu zariya uh, that is blocking the means uh, that scholars usually use. Sometimes you find even istihsan in trying to uh, protect that particular value that this maxim is promoting. Um, the fourth is al uh, to tajlib uh, taysir that hardship beget facility. Here we are looking at the values of compassion, the values of uh, ruksa, facilitation, easing things, uh, making things easy, relief, and uh, what have you. Um, and there still you would find things like maslaha playing a very significant role there uh, as some of the other tools you would find within the body of Islamic uh, law that are actually playing the role of protecting this uh, and providing these particular values. And the last maxim, is that uh, of al uh, 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 I mean al adab muhakkama al adab muhakkama uh, is saying custom and uh, culture has the weight of the law is authoritative and there what it's trying to promote and actually uh, protect is uh, the cultural values it's trying to preserve uh, norms the good norms of a society is trying to uh, appreciate identity uh, and preserve identity. And beyond that, it's trying to look at adaptation, uh, uh, particularly of the good conduct of society. And there, uh, you would find tools in usul like Urf and Ada, Istisha, playing a very significant role uh, in promoting those values of identity, the interest in goodness, uh, the, the, the question of adaptation and what have you. This is very interesting how each of the legal maxims, each of these kawaid, um, serve a function that is unique, but at the same time, in another sense, not completely unique. Uh, you will find them playing roles that are partially played in some of the sources of evidence, uh, either directly from the Quran or the Sunnah or the secondary sources of law. Um, in other words, you see a, a, an overlap between their interest, uh, just that the kawaid seem to be very focused on the spirit uh, more than anything else. Sister Salah, what would you add to this discussion? Yeah, I would like to add the fact that the um, kawaid are closely linked to the to usul of fiqh tools and also linked to the um, principles of maqasid and sharia. So it's never something that's used in isolation. It's always used in a balanced way with this. Then when we look at the five um, kawaiids themselves, from the use of one, we can see its connection to others. 
So the scholars would look at not just one maxim, they would look at the second and the third and the fourth. Let's take, for example, let's start with the first maxim, al-umuru bima qasidiha, where we are saying that every action that's done will be judged based on the intention behind it, as well as the purpose that it fulfills. Therefore, if the purpose is harmful, then that action will be judged to be something that should be prohibited, should not be done. That connects us directly to the makasi, um, to the Qaeda, al adwar al yuzal harm must be eliminated. Now, how do we assess what is harmful and the degree of harm? And how do we assess what is the best um, ruling to be made in such a situation? This then connects us with the idea of certainty. al la yazulu bishak. When we look at al yaqin la yazulu bishak, we are talking about certainty is not overruled by doubt. So we should respect that. Then we look at um, another one like al mashakot tajili butaisir, that's a state, when someone is in a state of difficulty, there should be some concession. Again, you then say, okay, so how do we rank or rate what that concession should be? How do we measure, which ties us back to al yaqin la yazulu bishak, and can tell us even to the first of them, al umuru bima qasidiha. Matters will be judged according to the purposes they fulfill or the intended outcome. When we look at the last one, al adam muhakkama, that custom is a basis for uh, making laws or has can have the weight of law, there's a qualification often made that it's good customs. It's customs that bring benefit. It's not customs that cause harm, connecting us back to adwar al yuzal so when we look at even the maxims themselves, they work synergistically. They are meant to work together and they balance one another. So within the field, the um, kawaid, they balance one another, just as they then connect with the field of usul al-fiqh and connect with the field of maqasid um, al-sharia. This is really interesting how, as you just explained, um, the maxims are universal but they also help qualify each other, they support each other. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you've beautifully explained how those five um, work in synergy to really help the mujtahid uh, assess his or her mm -hmm. fatwas. Now, um, you've started touching, and you've done the same to some extent, on the relationship between the Qawaid and Usul al-Fiqh. Um, Sister Salah, could you go a bit deeper in this subject, the role of this in Ijtihad and especially its relationship with Usul al-Fiqh? Okay. Um, let's use the first maxim as an example. Al-Umuru bi maqasidiha. Matters go with their purposes, the intention behind them and the purposes they fulfill. So here, as Brother Nasser mentioned, there's a concern for the consequences of actions, there's a concern for maintaining certain values. And that is where the um, Qaeda itself connects with the safety net principles, which are all about concern for consequences, such as maslaha, public interest. The concern is always, will a particular ruling, will, will a particular course of action bring benefit general benefit if there's going to be harm if it's not preserving the public of people the sorry the benefit of people generally then that should not um, be allowed to happen so there's equally a concern for um, consequences and values there as well if we look at another of the kawaid um, let's take certainty there should be certainty if you are if you have doubts about something then base your decision on what you are certain of. When we look at the um, madhahib, the different schools of Islamic jurisprudence, they all unanimously agree that the Quran and um, the Sunnah are the basis for everything else. These are the primary sources. And they say these sources are qat'i and authentic, especially when they are talking about hadith mutawatir, multiple chain hadith. When it comes to the others, the different schools will base their ruling on what they believe to be the strongest evidence. There is a way they would prioritize 
these secondary tools and even hadith ahad when they are looking in terms of the certainty of authenticity they would make these gradations based on what they believe to be the strongest so they go by way of what are we most certain of even the whole question of qat i dilala and dhan i dilala and qat i thubut and dhan um, thubut and dhan i wurud that whole discussion is about saying what are you most certain of and what is your basis what's your authority for saying you are very sure of this you are not so sure of that so in that case you can look at each of the five kawaid and see where they connect very closely with usul al-fiqh so those principles in usul al-fiqh that yes. deal with purpose yes um consequences we find are tied to the first maxim al-umur bi maqasidiha that mm-hmm. matters are judged based on their purposes yes. so not just the intention which is important mm-hmm. but also the consequences of the yes. action they would sometimes say the um, probable consequence mm. so you also see that gradation of when you say probable how yeah. probable is how it? certain, how are, certain we, are we which takes us to the second maxim that's yeah. concerned with maximizing truth in yes. other words moving closer to where the evidence takes us yeah. um Malam Nasir, could you elaborate on the remaining three and their relationship with usul? Now, now if you look at the third maxim uh, of Dararu Yuzal, um, basically the focus there is on the problem, addressing the problem, or eliminating the problem, or solving the problem. Uh, the obstacle, how do you take it away? Uh, how do you remove the mafsada? This is the focus uh, for that particular maxim. And if you go back to also some of the very important tools that helps you do that, uh, tools like Sadduzariya, that is blocking the means uh, to anything that is harmful, uh, Maslaha, which is a very important tool used by particularly the Maliki and the Hanafi school and even the Hanbali in trying to uh, render that particular role of blocking, uh, of eliminating harm uh, or protecting or shielding against harm. And you would find Hanafi at times also using istihsan to uh, play the same significant role. Now, if you shift to the next maxim, which is actually al uh, to tajlibu taisir, um, you one will wonder, one will like think that um, uh, in trying to see the relationship between the third and the fourth, um, just like saying, okay, if you cannot do anything about the problem, uh, can you do anything? Can you do something? Uh, about the victim, can you relieve, can you ease his situation or can you relieve uh, and bring some level of ease in the situation that actually one is. Uh, so it's now shift, the focus in now is now tilting or shifting to uh, the victim uh, as against the problem. Probably one has limitation in addressing the problem uh, in that context, then you will begin to look at, okay, how do you ease the problem? How do you become more compassionate? How do you find something that will give sort of relief to the victim? Uh, so that is the idea of al mashaqqatu tajlibu taisir And it's trying to protect the maqasid of a taisir and facilitation. Now, if you look at it, if you look at the, the, the usul tools, particularly the istidlal tool, again, maslaha, fatwa dariya, uh, which is about ruksa, for example, will be very useful uh, in trying to render this uh, role of um, uh, uh, finding comp- uh, finding ease, uh, being compassionate, uh, trying to provide some sort of relief. Uh, and the third one, uh, and the last one uh, in this rating is actually the, uh, the custom. Uh, as she mentioned, if we say custom, basically we're talking about the good custom uh, has the weight of the law or has the authority uh, of the law. This is um, not just Arab custom. That any good custom, mm. and that is why it is very much tied to the idea of istishab, where istishab is seen as a very general, maybe you say the custom of the entire world in almost everything. Uh, the idea of urf is now looking at context and what has been known to be part of their ada or part of the istishab of their culture uh, and values that are actually tied to them or more specific with them, where the filter is. If it is good, then it's accommodated from within the, the Sharia. And here, uh, the idea is about preserving and promoting the individual and the communal identity. Uh, and you find tools, as I mentioned, of istishab, 
uh, Urf and Ada uh, and to a large extent Masla and SDS and playing a very significant role uh, uh, in trying to uh, uh, help achieve that particular objective of preserving uh, promoting custom and that shows the relationship between usul and maqasid uh, i mean and and, and and gawaid in that context now uh, having said all this uh, from the very beginning if you look at the five universal maxims you would find them overlapping with uh, usul al-fiqh uh, as we rightly uh, captured the relationship on, uh, at the individual level um, and that shows the nature of intersection or overlap between almost all the three uh, uh, the qawaid the usul and as we are going to come and see when we come to talk about the maqasib sharia and that is one of the uh, significant things that help validate uh, uh, fatwas and positions particularly this idea uh, of triangulation and its significance in trying to get to the closer to the truth trying to establish using this particular approach as uh, has been rightly captured and mentioned. Allahu alam. Thank you very much. Um, I think this whole discussion helps us appreciate um, the perspective of Kawaid that specializes um, in just being most concerned about the spirit of the law. Uh, the level of certainty and what Sharia is interested in, the good it wants to bring, the harm it wants to remove, and ensure things are, um, uh, as uh, scholars would put in another maxim, which we will see probably later on, that al hukum yaduru ma'al illa wujud and aw adaman, that uh, uh, a ruling goes with its illa, goes with the presence or absence of its purpose. Uh, and one of the things that these qawaid do um, uh, is to check whether a ruling is actually meeting its objectives or not. The moment it's creating harm, then we should be worried about it. The moment it is no more fulfilling its purpose, then we should be concerned about the necessary reform uh, and the interconnection you have introduced of the usul tools embedded in the qawaid, as we could probably also speak about the qawaid uh, principles that are in usul, and as we will see later, um, the maqasid principles in usul, as we see uh, uh, usul principles in maqasid, and the same thing with qawaid. I think this uh, helps us see the bigger toolbox that scholars are able to use to improve the quality of fatwas, to improve the approximation uh, with which they are certain or get as close as possible to the sunnah in every situation, to representing the Prophet in his absence. I'd like to thank you for that uh, contribution. Jazakumullah khairan. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.